before we get started, I wanted to tell you about our upcoming Wrenchway Roundtable taking place on January 27th at 7 p.m. Central Time. The focus of this roundtable is how shops and schools can attract more students to the industry. We've got a really, really cool group of, of people to, to talk about it and really dive into this subject. We'd love for you to come. It's free to attend, and I think you're going to learn a lot. Beyond the Wrench with Jay Gunnan from Find the Wrench. Welcome to Beyond the Wrench. My name is Jay Gunnan, and I am your host. Today, we're lucky enough to have Timmy Martin join us from Red Oak Independent School District. How are you doing, Timmy? I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So uh, I have to start by kind of explaining um, how this came to be, how this this podcast came to be, which was uh, we saw a comment that you had on LinkedIn to one of Sarah's posts, I believe, and that engaged in another conversation. And and uh, it's cool to me because we've really, with this platform, been able to, to, st- to, I don't know, have these conversations that maybe we wouldn't normally have. So I'm excited to have you on, Timmy, uh, and, and really excited to get your perspective. You and I had a really nice conversation on the phone prior to this, and, um, and I think you're going to bring a lot to the podcast. So excited to have you on. Yeah, glad to be here. All right. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Timmy, uh, it, 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 what you do at uh, Red Oak ISD, what, uh, what your past has been that led you to that. Uh, really uh, interested. You've got a pretty fascinating history. Yeah, I, uh, it, I'll try to keep it short. It's, uh, it can get a little long-winded at times, but uh, I grew up in my dad's uh, car repair shop. He had a, a Volvo Mercedes and Honda repair shop called Born Again Cars in dallas texas um and you know grew up there um had a lot of opportunities to put my hands on things helping out the technicians um getting more than more than familiar with uh how cars operated and and getting familiarized with parts and things like that uh dad ended up moving away from the business and uh went into the quick lube industry and uh, had a, an upper management position there. So when I was in high school, um, anytime somebody called in sick from any one of the, the 30 some odd quick loop, uh, franchises around, uh, the Dallas Fort Worth area, uh, I got sent to fill in the, uh, the hole. So, um, got to work all over, uh, all over the city, um, working with a lot of different people working on every year, making model you can imagine that comes into a Jiffy loop. Um, and then that was, that was right, uh, as we were going into Iraq. So in, in 2002, three and four, um, and one night watching the news, uh, saw a lot of, uh, a lot of names strolling across the street of, uh, soldiers that had gone over and, and wouldn't be coming back. Um, being a an Eagle Scout, I, I felt obligated to uh, contribute in some way. I ended up signing up for the Army to be an artillery mechanic. Um, after spending three years in and doing one tour of duty to Iraq, uh, came home and decided I wanted to uh, do something a little less exciting. Um, so uh, my dad talked me into taking a look at some of the community college programs uh, that were working with manufacturers like the GM ASAP program or the Ford asset program Um, went and introduced myself to the instructors and got to, got to, to kind of tour their programs and see what they had to offer. And uh, even though I I've been a a lifelong uh, GM guy up to that point, uh, I really kind of hit it off with the Ford instructors and uh, figured that uh, if, if Fords were such garbage vehicles, I would have plenty of job security as a technician um and so uh started my ford training and while i was there i got to interact with uh some guys that were a little younger than me and uh, didn't have the breadth of experience that i had gained uh from growing up in a shop and working in the industry uh as long as i had at that point and and kind of got to experience what it was like to 
pass some of my uh, experiences on to those people. Uh, my instructor, Shane Baxter, he, he uh, you know, afforded me those opportunities and uh, really was a, a pretty great example of what a, an automotive instructor could be. After graduating the program and working at a, a diesel truck shop, working on F-250s through 650s every day, you know, decided that I really kind of enjoyed the opportunity I got to stand at the front of a classroom uh, more than I enjoyed fixing stuff every day. So started to go down the path and, and look at what it would take to become an instructor for automotive at the high school level. I didn't feel quite qualified to, to apply for a college position, but I knew that maybe I could train entry-level techs at the high school. Also with my history in scouting, I, I kind of liked working with, you know, young men uh, that were uh, looking for uh, another skill set that they maybe hadn't acquired yet. So uh, started to go take some college courses and uh, through a friend of a friend uh, riding bicycles one evening, I met the automotive instructor at a Dallas high school that would eventually be leaving his position and sort of opened the door for me on his way out and allowed me to get in there and start teaching. Uh, that was nine years ago next week. And so the, the rest is sort of, uh, sort of history. I stepped in to a classroom with very little teaching experience and just a, you know, sort of a desire to help some kids out and uh, ended up growing that program from 98 students to just under 300. Wow. Started out with just me and ended up hiring two more instructors to that program. And uh, uh, right, right as I was exiting Dallas, uh, we had established a, a dual credit relationship with that same community college district that I graduated from, uh, which is now called Dallas College. So launching that dual credit and, you know, affording kids the opportunity to take some ASC entry level exams and gain some certifications before heading off into either an independent or a, uh, a dealership. That is cool. I, I mean, that, that, that the way that you grew up through the industry and parlayed that, that, that really that knowledge into an educational role to me is, you know, you and I hit it right off, right off the bat. And that was, I think, one, I think our, uh, you know, our backgrounds are very similar in terms of growing up in a shop, but then two, um, I really respect that you identified that skill early on, right? And that you knew that that was something you wanted to do uh, and impact other lives. I, I, I just, I think that's awesome. Uh, and, and sounds like you're growing some programs down there that are really cool. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, I, I think, uh, so two things, uh, out of that statement, I, uh, I definitely knew and and when I talk to high school kids, I, I almost, I, I have a hard time finding any empathy when they don't know what they want to do with themselves, because I was so fortunate to, to, to almost know from birth, there's there's baby pictures of me wearing coveralls with a tow truck on them and i you know i've just i've kind of always known what i wanted to do with my life uh and turning wrenches was uh was it in in some capacity or another and i just happened to also have uh a passion for passing that skill on to somebody else so yeah it's uh yeah i i think that there's also a uh, <laughs> speaking about uh, hitting it off uh with you i think there is some sort of unspoken code between uh kids who who grow up in repair shops um you know maybe we we just uh know how to sword fight with wiper blades or something i don't know <laughs> well, that that's very very true now I, one thing that was clearly different in our paths was that you went uh the military route right and i before we dive into this other stuff i'm always curious as to the impact that the military had on your career and, and your, your experience with the army and kind of everything that you, you went through going to Iraq. Um, I, how, how, how did that impact you as a, I guess, as a person uh, and then as a professional, like once you got into the, into the uh, civilian life, if you will. 
So the military was a really, a really beneficial thing for me. I was, I was not a very good high school student. I didn't see a lot of uh, transfer from what I was learning day in and day out to what I wanted to do for a living. Uh, the high school, fortunately now it does have an automotive program, but when I went there, it did. Mm -hmm. So, um, I didn't see a lot of reason in showing up when I could be turning wrenches. Uh, the cool thing about the military was you signed up for a job and they trained you to do that job. And then you got to go do that job. There wasn't any auxiliary training, uh, with the promise of one day using it somewhere. <laughs> it was, here's what you need to know to do uh, the, these tasks and this, uh, this, this job, this profession. So that was something that I really appreciated off the, off the cuff with, with going into the military was I was going to be trained uh, and I wasn't going to waste any, any time because that's how I viewed it at, at that point in my life was if I can't use this, it's, it's not a valuable use of my time. And so I got trained to do that job, went straight into that that profession. Um, but there is a, a conflict of interest, I think, uh, for a lot of how it works minded people in the military. The military is very systematic and very regimented, and uh, you need to execute your orders and, and you know, asking questions and, and following up and trying to get some more context for the situation uh, isn't really <laughs> looked upon uh, very kindly. Yeah. And so you end up coming into some situations that aren't always logical. The, the one example I give is there was, there was a Humvee that needed to go out to the field uh, and it had a starter that was in op. And so uh, I, I went out, I diagnosed it. It needs a starter, go to the supply clerk, order a starter go back to the section chief, report what the issue was and that I got the parts on order. And he said, you know, well, that's got to go out to the field tomorrow. So I need you to go take the starter off of this vehicle and put it back or put it on the vehicle that has the NOP starter. And I said, okay, I've, I've been to the junkyard. I know how this works. I can cannibalize something. That's fine. So I, I do that. The Humvee starts up and goes out to the field. Well, two days later, the other Humvee that now has an NOP starter, it needs to go out to the field <laughs> and the starter, the new starter has arrived. Okay, no problem. I'll get the new starter. I'll change out the NOP starter. Oh no, no, no. That, that starter was ordered for the first Humvee. So you need to take the cannibalized starter and put it back on the second Humvee and put the starter you ordered on the first Humvee because that starter was ordered for that Humvee. And so, you know, I don't know a single technician in the world that likes working on the same problem twice. Right. And so there, there were some instances like that, sometimes daily, sometimes monthly. Uh, and, and there are, you know, that in conjunction with all of the other things that happen in the military that, uh, you know, can, can, discourage people from continuing their career to include a, a tour of duty to a, a, a not so great spot of the, of the world at the time that can kind of eat away at your soul yeah. <laughs> to, to do and undo work. And so, you know, that, that in conjunction with my experience in Iraq and I, I just decided that I could probably go fix things once uh, <laughs> in the civilian world and maybe be a little happier at the end of the day. I, and I, I want to add one thing to that or ask one more thing out of your comments there, because I think it's fascinating. And one of the challenges that I had, uh, especially when directly managing technicians or it, it might have been parts people uh, with a military background was one, my lack of understanding of their background, right? And And really the lack of understanding of the system, the systemization of everything and, and making sure that everything is done a certain way. Um, and then the other piece that I really kind of struggled with was the, uh, the part where they, they needed that direction, right? Or in, in a lot of cases, they needed direction. And so one thing that I 
struggled with admittedly was trying to get them to open up to, you know, okay, if, if somebody didn't give you direction, go do this other thing, right? Do you see that? Or was that more my experience? Uh, and, and I had a, a gentleman by the name of Charlie Shepard on the, the podcast earlier, another Texan, who he had a military background as well. And he had some great insight. And that's why whenever I, when I can talk that military transition and how we make it easier for somebody in the military to make it, make that crossover to the civilian world. I try to take, sure. I try to jump at it because I think it's a fascinating relationship. Sure. Um, I, now I, I, I only spent three years active uh, and, and two years in the reserves. So perhaps I wasn't as conditioned as maybe some other people come out as, Sure. But I, I definitely see where you're going, and I have uh, – I, I witnessed it while I was in the military. Um, younger soldiers who, uh, who would basically be uh, lost if not given directions. Right. Um, and so while I will say overall – Veterans that I've encountered and and people in the military usually in in a lot of capacities do have a lot of initiative, um, sure. but uh, I did I did definitely encounter people that uh, if not given direction were a little aimless, um, and so that I think here's the other thing that it, it it's kind of uh, it makes putting. Hmm, it, it makes describing people in the military very difficult uh, because, and this is sorry for the, the anecdote here. No, um, that's okay. it, my, my boy scout troop uh, was a high adventure troop before I, you know, made Eagle and, and got out of uh, scouting as a young man, I had stood on top of mountains and whitewater rafted and gone horseback riding in Colorado. And I've done all of these really kind of amazing things that you know th these are the kind of things that you see on the cover of the boy scout book <laughs> and yeah. that's what i knew scouting to be as i've you know now i haven't been active in scouting for 15 years and i i've encountered so many people that their experience in scouting was going over to someone's house and working on merit badges yeah and they went on a couple of campouts a year. So to, to, to use that anecdote in the military, I was stationed at, in, in Lawton, Oklahoma, uh, at Fort Sill. Hmm. And it was, you know, not to speak too poorly of Oklahoma, uh, as a Texan <laughs> that, that comes naturally, but you know, it wasn't exactly, uh, a really, uh, happening place, let's say. And so, I mean, they, they have three point beer for God's sakes. And so, and I had also, I had been, I did my schooling at Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland and, you know, Baltimore is right down the road. Yeah. So anyway, that is all to say, uh, I had a section chief, he was stationed in Kansas for a long time and he had the most positive outlook on the military was definitely going to retire, uh, and probably tack on a few years. And, you know, just could never imagine it being anything but great, but where he was at now wasn't. <laughs> yeah. And so that's where I started. That's my whole military experience is from that one, uh, that one post, uh, plus, you know, Balad, Iraq, uh, and training in a handful of other places. So I will say, you know, what you get out of a veteran that spent 20 years, you know, posted in Hawaii working on you know, relatively well-maintained vehicles versus someone stationed in, you know, Fort Irwin in the desert of California. Right. Um, you know, those are going to be two completely different soldiers. Um, and, and they're, you know, I also say if you, if you were to, to read all of the, the army uh, manuals, the, the FMs and the ARs, the army on paper is a beautiful machine and it is it is i won't go as far to say that it's perfect but on paper it's really it makes so much sense but then you put those fms and ars in the hands of human beings 
and and that's you know so it's really hard to say that you know all veterans have initiative and all veterans can act without um being micromanaged um it's really hard to say that but i i, I can't agree that i have seen it and uh and and it it I can I can definitely see how it would be a frustration for for management um, with someone coming in and expecting to see um, a sort of a, a a dress right dress and uh, yeah. a high speed soldier coming in that can knock tasks out without very much guidance. But uh, at the same time, they've been given pretty specific uh, instructions one step at a time for a long time. Yeah, and I think you hit it on the head there. And I say the same thing about technicians, right? Is oftentimes I feel like we put all technicians in the same bucket, right? And and that's mm-hmm. the industry as a general. And I think we do that a lot with military too. You know, we we'll we'll talk to shops that are probably a little bit more hesitant to hire somebody with military background. And I I don't always get that, right? Because I for the the most part, my experience with veterans has been very positive, um, you know, and, and I think the, the biggest thing that I look at is, okay, what are ways that I can learn to make their lives easier? What are ways that, you know, I can make their training translate? And I think you gave a lot of really, really good insight there. So I, I, I appreciate that. I think that's, that is really, really cool. Um, now on to kind of the, the subject of the day, and I apologize for kind of going off on that, that side. I didn't really intend to, but oh, no I, think, I think it's fascinating. Uh, but you've got a passion for the industry from being around it for all of your life, right? And, and I think one of the things that really stuck out to me in our conversation is that true want to help improve, uh, the want to make the industry better. Uh, the, the want to, you know, help put quality people into this industry. And you're really in a way or in a, in a position to be able to do that. But one of the struggles that we see is maybe that, that interaction from industry, right? And trying to get industry buy-in to what you're doing to try and grow your program. And I know for you, I, I want to start with kind of the, the intent of your program, uh, how you see it, but uh, you're, you're very much growth mindset, aren't you? Like uh, as far as I, I to me, that's, oh, that's what I got out of you as compared to other instructors that I've talked to. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, now the growth model just to be, when I say growth as an instructor and I'm talking to an employer that, that may come across as, I'm trying to put out more entry-level technicians every day. Mm-hmm. And that's what I've found to be a very difficult thing. In I think what we really kind of have to aim for is getting, and, and what I think I can serve uh, a capacity to do is getting a, a really great foundation built up for as many young people as possible. I think that what I do most days, um, I would love to be out in the shop every single day with my seniors, getting them ready to go into a job uh, at a dealer or independent. Um, but what I what I actually spend a lot of time doing is correcting misconceptions about the industry to these young people, because yeah. um, many of them are pretty and and not. This is in my book. This is not a bad word at all. A lot of them are ignorant um, as to how the industry operates and, you know, how they can make money in the industry and how uh, you don't have to be born knowing this stuff to be successful at it. So true. And, and even with, you know, we get a handful of students who know by the end of the first semester, like, this isn't really a profession I'm going to go into. And for those students, it's getting them familiarized enough with the industry that they don't fall into the same mindset as a lot of customers out there that uh, many shops are out to make a buck and not necessarily leave you a happy customer. I get a lot of students with that misconception that, you know, I need to know about cars because someone will screw me over if I don't. And that's, you know, 
that's just really not the case uh, in, in most, most businesses that are out there to be a part of that symbiotic relationship where they're helping you get to work, school, or uh, entertainment, and you're giving them monetary compensation for that. That's, that's what they want to be a part of 99% of the time. And unfortunately, there's been a reputation that's put and put out there and has trickled down to my, my students that, you know, there's some people out there that are, you know, up to uh, nefarious acts. And so I do a lot of correcting misconceptions, but I, I really see uh, high school programs as a way to uh, just introduce a large swath of students to the industry and really hopefully get a, a proportional number of them to want to go into the industry and actually be technicians. So, you know, if, so working in Red Oak now, um, it's not a very big town. Um, and, but we, they're absolutely hiring technicians in, in Red Oak and the surrounding areas. So, but not all of my students need to be technicians. Now I, I could absolutely serve as a, a technician farm to Dallas and, and the surrounding suburbs. Um, if, if I really get the program as big as I think the building can, can hold, but really my, my main goal is to, to take in a couple of hundred kids and say, well, you know, this year, X number of people are retiring from this zip code. Uh, you know, how can I replace those technicians right. and, and feed them off? And if we could duplicate that kind of model uh, to high schools around the nation, we wouldn't have a technician shortage anymore. Right. Um, and it, you know, we don't all have to. So going back to the initial question, the growth mindset, I'm not setting out to supply all the technicians to every dealer in Texas. Um, that's, uh, I'm, I'm setting out to serve my community uh, and their demands for, you know, uh, qualified people that can, can get in at the ground level and then build their career with a company. And I think that is so impactful. And that's something that I think shops need to have a clear understanding on too, right? And and what I love about you is you're very open to both the dealership world and the independents. It's not, you know, one or the other. It's it's really inclusive of everybody. Do you see, maybe, I, I guess, I want to talk about that piece a little bit more in depth, right? Is that struggle of trying to get maybe buy-in from industry in your program or and, and I don't even know if that's the sure. right word, but like doing it without the immediate outcome, right? Like where, where you're investing in a program that's going to eventually help you out, but it might not be tomorrow. Um, do you, is, is that right. something you see? Yeah. Um, and I will say uh, one of the few silver linings uh, since uh, we, we've gone uh, into this pandemic and, and are struggling through it. Um, Ford actually uh, did a really great job at, you know, reaching out and starting to provide uh, webinars and training. And I think that it was already in the works uh, for them to start reaching down to the high school level. And I know they had done it at a few campuses around my region. But when the pandemic hit, it was like, well, here's a bunch of online training, get your kids to sign up for it, and they can start working on this stuff. And so that Ford is, is the only one I've gotten offered through some of the connects that I have at, uh, the, the, at Dallas college at the, the junior college district here in, in uh, this area, I've gotten offers to provide some training from Honda, uh, with the, um, understanding that we would be purchasing, uh, intentional equipment for that. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it's called the Honda Express program. They've got uh, basically it's a it's a it's an oil catch can uh, slash tool cart. And if you if you have the equipment, then you can provide the training. Um, and so that was that was presented to me as an option for us. Um, now it's it's not a cheap piece of uh, it's not a cheap setup. Um, it, so it, at the time it was offered, it wasn't in our budget to take advantage of. Um, and there's 
Oh man. Um, we can, we can sort of sidebar this, but, um, uh, public school finance is absolutely a hurdle that, uh, it's possible for, uh, the industry to, to help us out with. Mm. Um, and so, cause what it takes for me to purchase something with my budget versus what it takes for someone in the industry to donate it to our program, yeah. um, is, well, it's a small stack of paper <laughs> difference. Right. Um, so anyway, we can sidebar that and, and carry on with that conversation if we want to talk about uh, equipment and tools. Um, so, yeah, so the, the, the major manufacturers have absolutely started to see it as a, a long-term investment. Um, I think that's, uh, I think that's a lot harder to do for an independent. Valvoline a while back had some training uh, that was that came down from, you know, the national or maybe even global level uh, that was available to high school students, and that evolved into more employability skills, not just uh, content on motor oil, and then that evolved into the local Valvoline Express reaching out. And, and asking about, you know, kids that might be of, uh, of a mind to, to actually start working. Um, and so Valvoline actually was, was taking a crack at it as well, but I don't think independence, um, and I, I don't really know what maybe the, the psychology is behind it. Um, we, we had a local shop, uh, at my old school, Adamson high school, uh, we had a, a shop called Safety Break, and we just had a, an amazing relationship with them. It was, you know, anything that was maybe going to be too much of a bite to take off of a vehicle, you know, maybe a staff member had a job come in and it was just going to be, uh, you know, like a, a cylinder head gasket or they had transmission issues and where we were at in the curriculum or where we were at in holiday breaks, there was no way we were going to get it done in a reasonable amount of time. Right. Um, we would, we would send them over to safety break and, you know, say, Hey, could you help us out here? What do you think about um, taking this on? And they were very helpful in donating, you know, used engines and things like that. Um, and, and letting a handful of kids come over and, and just walk around the shop they weren't ever in a position to hire anybody and I like not even to sweep up room. So where they were at in their, in their business model didn't make sense for them to be bringing on uh, helpers. And so, you know, whereas a dealership uh, bringing on an hourly person to, to kind of job shadow or, uh, or push a broom or stock a shelf in the parts department, I think there's a little more, financial liberty there sure. uh, for them. And I, I also at, at Adamson, I had a practicum program where the kids are intended to spend half of their time in uh, the transportation distribution or logistics world. And the jobs, there's a, there's a, a waiver to pay them less than minimum wage. It's one document you have to fill out and, or it could be an unpaid internship. And so many employers looked across the table at me and said, I can't in good conscience have a kid here doing anything and not pay them for their time. And I say, okay, that's great. I'm sure they would love to have a paid internship. And then they'd say, I can't afford it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and so, you know, we're caught between a rock and a hard place. And, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, what you do first, do you crack the egg or do you, do you slaughter the chicken? So, right. um, so yeah, there, that's, there's an issue there. Do you see issues with, um, with shops just not wanting to take an under 18 year old, uh, because of whether it's insurance reasons or, you know, whatever that might yeah. be? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's, and, and I don't, uh, there, there's an, an anecdote I, I share with my students about rules. Um, you know, why do we have speed limits? Why do we have 
uh, traffic signals and things like that. Well, it's because once upon a time we didn't have those things and something bad happened. <laughs> uh, and so I completely understand uh, if employers have had perhaps a negative experience with a young person in their shop before. And so I think that's one element of it. Um, when you get into dealerships or, or franchises or people that have a, a, uh, a legal department, 99% of the time they say we can't hire anybody under 18 insurance. And, you know, they're, they're very nice. They're very eager to hire someone over 18 with a driver's license. But as soon as the insurance conversation comes up, that's, that's pretty much where the line is drawn. And I, I can't, you know, I haven't been successful in, in clearing that hurdle. Right. Um, and that, I think, you know, kind of touching back to what I was saying about opening the door to as many people as we can. And not to not to rail against insurance, but who closed the door to the shop in the first place? Right. You know, it, it became an insurance liability to have customers coming back in the shop. It became, you know, an insurance liability to have young people in the shop. Uh, so not to rail against insurance, uh, I'm a big fan of it in most cases, <laughs> um, but it, it has really put a damper on, uh, sort of an apprenticeship model, uh, for, for the high school aged kids. Yeah. I, I, I think that's something that's probably definitely changed from when we were, you know, when we were growing up in the industry where, mm -hmm. you know, maybe that's because we were directly involved with, you know, the family, but I think I, I see so much resistance from shops to want to bring somebody in. And, and I think it's because they're scared, right. And they don't know the rules around that, or maybe they're just, you know, they're assuming they can't do it because other places don't do it. Um, and, and they're maybe just generally concerned about somebody's safety and not, you know, not putting themselves in a good position that could end up being, you know, uh, detrimental for everybody involved. Right. And, and so, right. That's the part where, you know, I see maybe some opportunity to, you know, if, if you're a shop out there listening to this, you know, are there things that you can do to get them exposed to the shop, maybe off hours, or, you know, maybe when, um, you know, you're, you're, you're not right in the thick of things where something can go wrong, and you can really give that person the supervision they need. I, I, I don't know, when I look at it, I think we've got to start looking at avenues to which we can do that a little bit, maybe. Am I am I off base there? Oh no, I think you're. I think you're absolutely on target. Um, and I, uh, so my my father uh, used the term gopher, yeah, very often. And I I always thought it was funny as a kid because you know uh, word association produces an animal in my mind, <laughs> uh, a funny looking gopher. Uh, and he said, no, go for this, go for that. And, you know, that kind of experience, not putting tool to vehicle, just putting a tool in the hand of a professional. And I also am really in love with uh, the term job shadowing. You know, shadows literally can't pick up tools. Shadows good point. Can't, can't really do much of anything but follow you around. <laughs> you know, and get in your way of a, of a shop light. Um, no. Um, so yeah, but, but job shadowing is those kinds of experience. And I, and I also say, um, I think I've actually already said it a couple of times here, uh, you know, pushing a broom. And I mean that literally just being in the presence of, of work being done on vehicles has an impact on, on young people. And there's also, you know, I, I have students that come from all different kinds of backgrounds, uh, kids that have grown up with money, kids that are working a part-time job to help pay bills. And while training kids to go into an industry that can be pretty lucrative, I'll have kids that are working a part-time job at Jack in the Box. And it, it came up a couple of years ago, you know, Nobody is, is extraordinarily proud of working in the fast food industry, right. but uh, some kids were, were kind of chuckling at him when he, when he said where he worked. And I said, now, wait a minute, guys, I want you, I want you to stop 
like, first of all, this, this isn't a place where we're going to laugh at other people for earning a paycheck, period. Right, exactly. Second of all, and I thought about it for a minute, and I walked over to, I've got a, a transaxle uh, that a couple of my kids, first couple of years I was teaching, they took a, a, a grinder and cut a couple of sections out the side of a transaxle so you could see what was going on inside, sort of a poor man's cutaway. Yeah. Um, and I pointed to the smallest gear inside that transaxle, and I said, can that transmission work without that? And they said, well, not correctly. And I said, this guy right here is going to go to work this afternoon and make sure that somebody has a meal so that they can go to work tomorrow and work. And that person might be the mayor of this city. They might be the CEO of AT&T in that tower right there. Yeah. Um, every cog counts. And it like, so literally pushing a broom, that student can feel like they helped that business go another day and fix another car and get another person to work or school. So those kinds of experiences, even as, as minute or music school as they might seem to, to the owner of a, of an independent shop, they can really impact that student and put a lot of pride in them in, in the way they get started in the industry. Um, and there, there's also, I have now generated a lot of pride when I was, when I was 15, 16 years old working at Jiffy Lube for almost the first year, I, I washed windows and vacuumed floors and checked tire pressure and put reminder stickers in the window. Yeah. And, you know, I look back on that and I was pissed. All I wanted to do was be down in the pit. All I wanted to do was be under the hood of the car. And, and talking to uh, the the occasional attractive customer uh, and trying to sell them an air <laughs> Um But I was over here stuck, uh, you know, checking tire pressure and, and washing the dirt off the back window. But now I look back on that and I say, you know, I can, I can check the crap out of some tire pressure and <laughs> I can wash the hell out of some windows because of that time that I spent. And I also, you know, the handful of times that I got, you know, an older gentleman or, or, a, or a lady would pass me a couple of bucks as a tip for pulling their car off the, off the, um, out of the bay. Um, you know, I saw that people appreciated my actions, even though I didn't see a lot of value in them. Yeah. You know, I was doing I was doing the, the grunt work of what we did at that establishment. But now I look back on it and I say, you know, while I worked at that place, there wasn't a single car that rolled out with dirty windows. Yeah. And that's that's a valuable thing uh, that I can look back on as that experience. So, you know, if if you to speak directly to, to some business owners right now, if you have some minuscule task. Uh, that you can you can pull a kid out of an auto tech program at the high school and put them on it, uh, you know, stocking shelves, uh, pushing a broom, you know, spreading some dry sweep out and, and cleaning up around the shop. Um, if they're eager and willing, uh, please don't hold them back because that, nice. that can be something that can be their foot in the door to a really rewarding career. Well, and that was my first job in a shop, right? Like was with with my dad. And, you know, if it was that I was 14 or 13 years old or whatever it was, um, you know, I, I had worked in the office side of it for, for a while prior to that, which is probably a little bit unique in itself. But I, I, I always, oh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I remember putting stamps on mailers. Exactly. Because uh, my that, parents mailed out uh, oil change coupons and stuff like that. <laughs> well, and the going into the, like into the shop uh, and even if it meant emptying garbages or like we used to burn mm -hmm. boxes, right? Like we, we'd burn the cardboard in the back. Uh, like th there was just so many things that like I learned one, how to get around the shop and like where things were at. But then two, I idolized the people that worked on cars, right? Like that was my, oh, yeah. those were my heroes, right? Those are the people that were doing what I wanted to do. And it was setting that precedent early 
that, hey, this is a pretty cool job. And I, I think we miss that a lot in, a, in the industry right now. And it might be because of insurance reasons, but there's also got to be a willingness from the shop to maybe think outside the box and, and make some of, this, some of this stuff happen. You know, I, I think you're spot on there. Yeah. Now, um, just as a, a primer for that, um, we do have, uh, this is in a, another suburb of Dallas uh, called Grand Prairie. Their school district has uh, made an insurance uh, solution so that the, the school district actually purchases insurance. Wow. Um, and that, that allows um, you know, those seven, at least 17 year olds, I believe it may be down to 16, but I, I'm foggy on all the details, sure. but I know that insurance was purchased and they have a relationship with a Lexus dealer to be sending students on a, on a rotation. So, um, wow. there is a solution out there. Um, but again, that school district, um, may be a little more, uh, financially capable to, to make that move. Um, whereas I know the, the district that I, I previously worked for, I brought it up on multiple occasions and it was, it was not something that was, uh, seen as a, a, a viable option because of cost. So, um, that I, I can't say exactly what, what the, the big hang up was, but I would assume that was a, a primary concern. Um, also it, it, and I'm just, I'm kind of, uh, brainstorming here as to what other issues could be. Um, we would have to then as, and this is speaking as a former employee of Dallas ISD, that would mean that Dallas ISD would have to pick, you know, one establishment, maybe a couple to then, make this this policy or policy rider come about with um and you know the eighth largest school district in the world throwing all of their weight into one dealership may you know bother people um so again that's just me uh kind of thinking about maybe how a large school district would approach that situation uh but never really getting an answer yeah i want i want to talk about that a little bit more so do you do you have a like an advisory committee like an in, like industry kind of advisory committee of shops in your area? I know you kind of talked about wanting to form one. Um, do, do you have anything of that like level uh, to, of like industry outreach? So the way that industry out, outreach has worked uh, for me personally, it has not been nearly as organized as an advisory committee. So. Okay. Um, I have, um, I was trying, uh, I will say it wasn't a priority to me. Uh, like I've, I've definitely seen it be a priority for other campuses, uh, with auto tech programs. I tried, uh, to get involved with skills USA and didn't have a great buy-in with the students, but skills USA had a lot of resources on starting an advisory committee. And, um, it did prompt me to get out there and introduce myself to a lot of local businesses, part stores, independents, dealerships. And I can tell you that, um, four or five, uh, real tight knit people that actually knew my face and knew my name when I walked in the door, um, and knew that I was you know, I did what I did and I was, I was pushing toward a goal of getting kids in a job. Um, but we never had a meeting. Now that's not to say that the district didn't have an advisory committee. It just was a blanket advisory committee for all career and technical education or, um, you know, but it took place two or three pay grades ahead of me. And so those meetings were taking place and I can say that I wasn't involved uh, in more than a couple of, of meetings with district administration and business owners. And I, I've also been, I, I have the last couple of years worked as an adjunct professor at, uh, it's, it, uh, I get such a case of imposter syndrome when I say the word professor, uh, adjunct instructor. Um, 
at uh, Cedar Valley College, one of the the Dallas College junior colleges. And so working as an adjunct and and also being a high school instructor that potentially fed students into those post-secondary programs, I attended advisory committees for the uh, college automotive programs. So I had a good model for it, but I had never really put anything into action that was automotive specific. Um, and that, you know, I, I carry that around with me a lot and I need, and, and part of, of moving to, uh, Red Oak ISD, that is a, a major professional goal of mine is to get an automotive specific advisory committee, have a couple of meetings a year and, and really try to, to bridge that gap, uh, of communication and, and also of, of getting kids to work in those, those establishments. Do you have a way of interacting with local shops? I know like you, you pointed to maybe the one shop that you work with, but how, say if a, if a shop, whether it's a dealership or an independent wants to get more involved, what, what, what's a good way for them to do that? Is it just reaching out to you or is it, and, and I don't mean just for your school, but like for any school across the U S like, What's a good way for, for somebody to really like that, that has that proactive mindset that wants to help out for them to engage? Absolutely. Well, I can tell you what it's looked like for me so far. Um, I have a 98 Honda Civic and I get in it and I drive to that establishment <laughs> and I get out <laughs> and I walk in the door and that's, that's usually how communication is established. So, yeah. but if, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a business, uh, if you're, if you're an automotive, you know, a dealership or, a, or an independent or a quick lube. So now working at a school district with one high school and also working at a district with a, a lot of high schools, right, uh, right. Uh, both of them have a career and technical education department. And you can, you can kind of go about it two ways. You can call me directly. I, I'll, I would put my office phone number out on the phone, the podcast right now. Uh, well, and we, we can, we can, we'll put your, your contact information great. in the, the show notes. Uh, just so if yeah. anybody in the Dallas area does want to reach out, we'll, uh, we'll try to, to help <laughs> with that. But yeah. yeah, no, that's perfect. So, but I would say, um, you know, it would probably take about, um, eight to 10 minutes of a phone call to call your local high school, ask if they have an automotive program. And if so, can you connect me to the instructor? Um, so that's route number one. Route number two uh, would be to contact the CTE department um, and let them know that you want to get on the advisory committee or uh, you know, have a conversation about how you can develop that relationship more. Um, I'll tell you that the instructor though, uh, is probably gonna, if you can, if you can kind of tackle it from, uh, the, the high end of the administration and from the ground level with the instructor, uh, you're probably going to have the, the best level of success there. Um, cause I That's know, uh, me getting an email and then getting an email from my CTE director that afternoon, uh, is absolutely going to make sure that. I get you on the phone and have a conversation by the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Take all the support you can get, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. This is good. I, this is, and we're actually kind of bumping up on our hour already. Um, and I, this is, this is really awesome stuff. And this is a lot of the stuff that we're trying to do with Wrenchway too, right? And trying to make sure that we're bridging those, those gaps and, and, um, I think we got some cool stuff to help you out, but I, like, I think just in general, your insight is fascinating to me because I, you know, I think we could probably go for another, uh, well, probably the rest of the afternoon talking through this because there's so much that we have to, that I think we need to dive into. Right. And yeah, I, and, I definitely agree. I have not uh, even broken into my soapbox script yet. Um, well, if, <laughs> I, if we'll, we'll, we'll put you, so let's, uh, let's say, well, let's extend this a little bit, just because I think there's some value here. If, if you've got time, sure. um, if we can do another five to 10 minutes here, I think I, there's, there's probably, I mean, like I said, it's just so hard to cover everything in such a, you know, a short amount of time, but 
why don't we talk a little bit more about some of the stuff I know that you and I have talked about on that industry support side and, and making sure that we get these shops involved because I, I truly think if, if we want to tackle this thing, that, that is the technician shortage, if you will, um, we, we've got to have this right. Sure. Um, yeah. So, it, so to, to think about the things that uh, I encounter every day uh, that stand in the way of, of me either providing training or, uh, you know, getting those, those students uh, off of the graduation stage, um, or I guess, uh, as of right now, off of the graduation Zoom call um, and into a shop, um, I would say, uh, you know, funding is, is a big part of it. Um, we have limited budgets and uh, we have to think uh, very carefully and prioritize, you know, what needs to have uh, the highest, uh, highest level of attention when it comes to training um, to, to serve them, my students, uh, as, as well as possible to get them uh, prepared to go into a job and, and have a skill set that an employer is looking for. Um, right. And so, you know, I don't know if you've looked at the cost of, a, of an alignment machine lately. Um, right. <laughs> Or, you know, we, my district, we were fortunate enough to, to, to find some, some money for a new uh, tire mounting machine. Uh, but um, so I'll speak on, we'll just talk Hunter for a second. Um, you know, Hunter is, I mean, that's a household name. If anybody out there owns a shop, it's, it's an industry leader and it's, it's absolutely found at some level in every shop I've ever walked in, uh, be Absolutely. it, be it dealer or, um, you know, they either have a hunter brake lathe or they have a tire machine or they have an alignment rack. I any one of their products you're likely to find somewhere in the shop. Well, Hunter, uh, and for good reason, um, you know, we would love to purchase their equipment. Uh, and we obviously have, um, but the, as we all know, in the repair industry, things break. And so we have to then pay someone, uh, pay a professional to come repair that equipment. And that, that doesn't, um, that doesn't come free. So, um, when, when I think about industry being able to support a high school program, um, if they're looking to do it in a, in a financial way, uh, making sure that we have, the equipment that our students are going to see once they leave. And so I'm, I'm always torn uh, when it comes to this because I've got local shops that are dealing with decade old hunter machines. <laughs> and so, you know, do we, do we buy the fancy new one? And then this kid isn't going to know what they're looking at because it doesn't have a touch screen. Or do we train them on the best equipment and know that that foundation of, of knowledge is going to carry them through on, on any piece of equipment? And then also, if we do, if, if it is the suggestion of an advisory committee that we buy a new machine, is there any level of support to make sure that that machine can keep training those students for the long run? So I was, I was suggested uh, by someone to purchase a particular piece of equipment in my last, uh, in my last district. And, you know, we followed through on it and it, it ended up being increasingly difficult to get the thing fixed. So when it breaks and then they always will, you know, making sure that that shop at that high school has, uh, the means necessary to produce the product you're looking to see, uh, can go a long way. Um, and so, but to, to solve a problem before it's created, I, I think almost daily about why there's a funding issue for CTE programs. Um, yeah. and you know, I, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that you, uh, are, are in the same era of, of, uh, of life as I am. Uh, yeah. we were, you know, we were sold. 
uh, a a college for all dream uh, sure. by our parents and by the schools and by the colleges at the college fairs and um, I think that we still uh, have a lot of of time and energy and money pushing as many students towards those college programs and and every time I see money uh, paying paying to to push more students in that direction, I feel like that's dollars that could have been directed towards, uh, you know, our automotive program or our cosmetology program or one of many other trade programs. Um, because, and, and this is, uh, I, I don't want to walk on eggshells because I think I'm among like-minded folks here, but for sure, I have never taken the SAT uh, or the ACT. And I have absolutely spent a lot more money on ASE tests than I ever will on uh, an SAT, ACT, or GRE. <laughs> but there are school districts around the nation right now that are paying for those tests for students who aren't going to get much out of that experience. Uh, right. And it's, it, it, it totals up to millions and millions of dollars. Um, and it's it's just one of those situations. Another experience from from the military is, you know, when the military buys uh, hammers, everything goes to the lowest bidder. Well, if the lowest bidder is going to sell you a hammer for twenty three dollars, uh, well, then the army is going to buy a hundred twenty three dollar hammers, uh, regardless of the fact that you could go over to to the big box store and buy one for twelve. Um, <laughs> and so I just I feel like we're we're pouring a lot of money, uh, and still, even though uh, legislatures and the school districts have sought uh, more CTE programs and and tried to develop them more, we still pour a lot of money into the college for all mentality. Yeah. And so, uh, how how as business owners uh, we could maybe af- affect that or impact that is to write your school board or your or your city council or your legislature and say you know i know that i'm paying taxes uh, that are funding all of this testing but that doesn't help out my business really in any way i need i need these training programs that are training my future employees uh, to be outfitted with the equipment they need and start raising some questions like uh, you know, where are my tax dollars really going here, dollar for dollar in education? Um, and getting more involved in that process would be really helpful. And again, we're talking, you know, investing time and energy into something that will impact you maybe years later, maybe decades later, um, by the time legislation gets passed or or budgets get approved. So yeah, there's my there's my little soapbox speech. <laughs> Well, I, I, I think this is great stuff. And I, I really hope that we're able to kind of continue the conversation uh, even through maybe further podcasts or um, even just in, in general, being able to talk, talk through things, because I think that's such a, such a piece, such a vital piece to, um, to what we need for the long haul is really opening that door of communication between industry and between schools, make sure we understand where the other is at. Right. And, and I think this is, this is a really, really cool start to that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to growing our relationship and I'm looking forward to trying to, uh, trying to, you know, work with you to, to identify some things that we can do as an industry to help out. And, and, uh, hopefully we're able to do that. Yeah. I think, uh, one thing that the, episodes that I've listened to of the show, um, I think that we all are uh, problem solvers. And yes. if we know, if we can get down to, you know, where the problems exist, uh, I think we all uh, have an innate desire to, to resolve it. So um, I, do I think, I think more conversations like this and, uh, you know, more, more problem solvers with the resources to, to, to tackle those issues, uh, hearing it is, is excellent. And I, I commend you for uh, getting this thing kicked off and, 
and growing the the network that you already have. It's it's really amazing. Well, I I appreciate it. It wouldn't uh, certainly wouldn't be possible without people like you and and people that are forward thinking and and uh, wanting to to help make this uh, this awesome industry even better. So uh, appreciate everything, Timmy. We'll have you back on the podcast, I'm sure, at some point since we touched about a tenth of I think what we were going to talk about. <laughs> uh, but but I, I I really enjoyed this, and I, I think you brought so much value to our listeners today, and and um, and look forward to uh, talking to you again. Yeah, anytime. Just let me know what you need. All right. Thank you, Timmy.